Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, uh, you can already recognize for, for those who are familiar with the geopolitics. It's, uh, you know, with you, Robert D. Kaplan, a famous geopolitical writer, author of many books, uh, which we discussed at Strategy in Future in the past. And uh, right now, uh, Robert holds uh, a chair in geopolitics at the Foreign Policy Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, hello, how are you? Fine, very good. I'm glad to be here. Uh, of course, I have, uh, you know, like thousands of questions, but let me focus on three most important, but not small ones, so to speak. So I very much re re remember your essay to, to the Pentagon called Marco Polo's World, the consolidation of Eurasia, the future that is upon us in Eurasia. I speak to you from Eurasia, from Warsaw, Poland. You are in, uh, on the East Coast in the United States, so uh, the, the world ocean separates us, okay? Uh, I have read, I think, most of your books, and because Eurasia is the center of the world, so I'm on the continent, and actually I am the subject of your uh, books, and my life, my destiny, my future, and my fate, and my past has been and will be sort of uh, many times um, uh, commented and discussed about in your books. And I remember very well the thesis from Marco Polo's world is that Eurasia is consolidating. The United States is sort of uh, ebbing away, or might be ebbing, when you were writing it like three or four years ago, might be ebbing away from Eurasia. Mm. And uh, times of time of empires will come back. Chinese empire, Russian empire, Turkish empire, Europe, sort of European empire. Those faded empire of uh, empires of the past will resurrect. So how would you relate to that after this three or four years time? Um, I think it's, it's, it's actually borne it out the last three or four years. I realize that post-colonial studies and uh, criticism of empire is very much in vogue in the academic world now. But I don't believe you can understand international relations of today and geopolitics today without referring to empire. Because although, that, all, although the Russian czarist Soviet um, um, uh, empire, the Chi you know, the various Chinese dynastic empires no longer exist. The mentality uh, emanating from the Kremlin, from Beijing, from Ankara are all partly imperial. And you can't really understand what they're about unless you study their imperial pasts. And, and in terms of Europe, the European Union, which is headquartered far away in Brussels in the Northwest and has daily influence over the lifestyles and eating habits and so and the laws of countries throughout Europe from Portugal to Bulgaria, from the, Prussia, from the, from the lands of the former Carolinian and Prussian empires uh, all the way to the Ottoman and Byzantine empires, the European Union is an empire in all but name, uh, uh, um, in, in a sense. So this is continued. Um, and, but at the same time, we live in a smaller, more, can, more shrunken world. And this shrunken world means that Europe is increasingly becoming a, you know, a, a peninsula of Eurasia. Um, it always was in a technical geographical sense, but it's becoming more so, I think, uh, in, a, um, in a geopolitical sense. And although the United States occupying the temperate zone of North America is half a world away from, from, uh, from Eurasia, from the mother continent of Eura Afro-Eurasia, um, nevertheless, it's closer in terms of time, distance with ransomware, you know, disease pandemics, et cetera. So the, so the tension between the, uh, between the United States and Russia and China 
and even with the EU, will continue. I don't think there's been much of a change since I wrote that piece uh, uh, four years ago, which I believe I finished the piece before Trump became president, just before. And now we're just after Trump has become president. Now, there are a lot of weird and crazy things about Trump as president, but I don't think these things have been affected that much. I, I think the dynamic has stayed the same in that sense. Yeah, very in interesting. But if I could, uh, you know, build on, on, <clears throat> on this thesis uh, of empires and, you know, gross realms, uh, the, those big spaces where the economic forces sort of uh, impose, uh, so, you know, briefly, so what do you think, what would be the future of this European empire and the Russian um, empire? That, will, that, will they bargain the space uh, somehow? Uh, it's, how it's a very good question because the European, the EU empire is very dynamic in terms of change. Because it's gradually becoming more of a German-led empire, uh, you know, you know, where the capital of the empire is less so in Brussels and increasingly so in Berlin, mainly for economic reasons, because of the dominance, uh, the economic dominance of Germany and Germany's ability, at least so far, to produce moderate leaders, not weird and crazy leaders. Uh, you, know, you, you know, the Germans are pacifistic and they're moderate. That's what we've seen from them in recent decades. We may have a change in the end of with the election in September, but we may not. And it seems that, you know, whoever is, a, you know, whatever party or parties or coalition emerge in Berlin, uh, they're go, you know, they'll be to the center right or the center left, more or less, with very conservative, prudent economic policies. And this will give Germany more power. And I think, you know, we've had, um, I think, some um, interesting geopolitical political news in the last few weeks. The Biden administration has decided to give up on trying to stop the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And with this pipeline, this second Nord Stream pipeline coming into play, uh, Russia will truly be immersed in the politics and the economics of Europe, um, uh, uh, you know, in that sense. And, um, and it, so, so it will be. It will be hard. And, and the Germans have basically agreed, uh, you know, agreed to have a normal relationship with Russia. That yes, they'll criticize Russia for human rights and all of that, but they will deal with Russia very closely. Um, and that's that's new. Uh, you know, this Nord Stream 2 pipeline is important, especially as we enter a greener age. And if you think of natural gas as a bridging fuel between a dirty coal and oil age and a, and, and, and a, and a clean age of renewables, air and wind, natural gas is sort of a bridging fuel between the two eras. And there will be spur lines where natural gas will be sell, sold elsewhere in Europe from Germany after Germany gets the gas from Russia. So um, I think this is a big change since I wrote the article. Exactly. And that, that was my next question. Uh, so what happened in D.C. and in, in the White House that the United States sort of, sort of, uh, Dismiss this Mackinder's concept of you know of uh, that the U.S. that the sea powers need to sort of have a wedge between Russia and Germany, that they are always against consolidation of the European Peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two world wars about it, you know, with, uh, with yeah, Germans. So what happened? Was it China that was such a challenge that uh, it pushed the the and, and, and that the pushed the uh, the Washington elites. Uh, in favor of this, you know, uh, realignment with Germany and accepting sort of this role of Russia. And my question is very much important in the region where I sit, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, uh, as we are s s treating it as an ebbing of the sea power of the United States from the region with uh, huge implications for security situation in the region. Yes. Um, first of all, keep in mind, 
that since the administration of George H.W. Bush, the elder Bush, you have not had geopolitical thinkers in the White House. Uh, you know, Amer American post-Cold War administrations, Clinton, George W. Bush, Trump, um, Biden, don't consciously think geopolitically in the way that Cold War American presidents from Truman to the elder Bush did. You know, the Cold War was sort of an extension of World War II, a low end, a, a tailpiece of World War II, which forced, which, which forced uh, you know, which, which which forced the people in the White House to, to to concentrate their minds on geopolitics to a much greater extent than we have now. I think from the Biden administration's point of view, they couldn't stop it. They saw that it was hard to stop. Um, and they wanted that they're, they're searching in a way for better relations with Russia in order to focus on China, exactly as you said. Um, but the real criticism of Biden's action is not that he allowed the pipeline, but that he did not extract concessions for Ger from Germany for it. There's a feeling, this, you know, among quite a lot of people I've spoken to in Washington, that he should have exacted his pound of flesh from the Germans, especially since Merkel is going out. And, and, and the pipeline is somewhat controversial in Germany itself. Not all the candidates there were in favor of the pipeline. So you would have thought that the administration could have gotten more out of the Germans. For instance, a commitment to raise their defense budgets, um, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, a little bit. But they seem to have just given it away. Um, uh, which to me demonstrates weakness. You know, the issue is not that they allowed it to happen. It's nine tenths done anyway. They probably couldn't have stopped it, but they didn't negotiate hard about it. Yeah, plus U.S. promised to the countries in the region that they would stop it. Uh, and that's always, uh, you know, a, a deficiency on credibility. Uh, yes. And, and uh, you know, that might create a sort of a new, not a banda wagoning, but a new balancing game that will be triggered yeah. in Central and Eastern Europe. If you could see the belt of countries from Sweden to, through Poland and Ukraine and Romania, uh, that is quite a, you know, a piece of, of uh, real estate. Uh, and everybody's thinking now, where's US? I mean, uh, what, what happened? Yeah. Now, especially I, that, that the Germany is really playing the continental game. I, I mean, we, we, as you said, there are no geopoliticians among the US uh, the presidents. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the economic zones. And uh, Germany is, uh, interests are moving more and more towards the continental game, with China being the biggest market, uh, supply chains, and so on and so forth. And that was not the world we sort of joined as Poland yeah. and Central and Eastern Europe. I would Europe. go further. I would go further and say, if you look at Germany, the great power of Central Europe is going to be getting its energy from Russia. Its largest trading partner is China. And it's being defended by the United States. That's a great deal if you can get exactly. it. Exactly. You know, I mean, Germany is more is is in a functional sense a neutralist power now, a pacifistic neutralist power, and Europe then becomes the fight zone between the U.S., China, and Russia because America. Asian allies have big defense budgets. They're much more willing to defend themselves militarily. And they feel ch the threat of China much more than, than the European countries do. So, so the United States, you know, there's an, there are problems with the European alliance that don't exist with the, with the Asian alliance. Um, and I think we, you know, it's two things you mentioned, you, you know, which are very, which should be emphasized, which is number one, when countries like Romania or Poland see the U.S. give on some, give up on something that, that it had promised, there's a real feeling of disenchantment and, you know, a, you know, a loss of confidence and faith. Um, because I say Poland and Romania because Poland's the big power in Central East, you know, of the former Warsaw Pact in the northern tier of the former Warsaw Pact. And Romania is demographically in the southern tier. Um, um, so, you know, you know, there's a real disillusionment that could set in. Also, another thing, you know, if we think about Mackinder's heartland, 
and we think about a German Russian uh, al- not an alliance, but a, an understanding. Um, you know that creates a big power dynamic in Mackinder's, you know, in Mackinder's former heartland, which puts more, which may, I say, may put more pressure on the countries in between, from from the Baltic states in Poland in the north to Bulgaria in the south. Yeah, especially that the, the the warfare has changed. Uh, this, you know, there there are no great wars with millions of conscripts, but the new generation warfare, where you con- control the mechanism of frictions and flows of strategic flows, you know, transfer of people, movement, cyber, uh, transmission of data, and so on and so forth, uh, that you can impose your political will on the other party uh, in that way. Th- this is what we fear. But moving away from you know my regional. <laughs> My, my own theater of operations and uh, going, navigating towards the most uh, seminal question of today, US-China rivalry. Uh, let's imagine that you run the show, Robert, that you have all decision-making and all stake in the, you know, you, you control all the leverage of power in DC. What would be your optimal grand strategy of United States towards China today? And how would you explain it, present it to your allies? Right. You see, China, uh, in 1971 and 72, when Nixon and Kissinger went to China, China really needed the United States because the Soviet Union's military was bearing down on it. So, you know, the Soviet Union and China almost went to war in the late 60s and early 70s. So China needed us. They needed that rapprochement. Today, China does not. China doesn't need the United States, um, uh, really. You know, nobody's threatening war with it. China has a big military, a great navy, um, etc. Um, but I don't think the Chinese intend to invade Taiwan because they don't need to. Number one, uh, you know, over time, they can make an end run around Taiwanese sovereignty by taking over its economy with the threat with cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns, etc. Also, if you launch a military campaign against Taiwan, there's always the chance you could lose. Um, And if you lose, that would really damage the, the hold of the Chinese Communist Party on China. It would damage the Chinese economy, et cetera. So I think there's room for China and the United States to have an accommodation. I think what's going on now is the Biden administration is trying to build up leverage against China, you know, working closely with allies, selling more weapons to Taiwan to make an invasion more costly and make the chances that China might actually lose such a military confrontation greater. Um, It's building up leverage, but I think the goal is, the goal is to come to some sort of an arrangement with China, some sort of, the way I would put it, the US and China cannot solve their problems. They cannot stop disagreeing. But what they can do, which is what the Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon administrations did after the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, was to build parameters around this conflict. You know, set up rules of the road so that an accidental military military war in the South China Sea or Taiwan, for instance, does not happen. You know, that's the best you could do. So my goal, my strategy would be to build rules of the road, set parameters through, you know, through constant negotiations, summit meetings, um, et cetera, working with allies, all of this, but first building up leverage, which is what the Biden administration is doing, because Trump gave up a lot of leverage, remember. He didn't work with, with allies. He allowed Ch- Japan and South Korea, two staunch U.S. allies, to get into a debilitating trade dispute with each other that never should have happened. Um, so, I think build leverage in order to come to some sort of 
a, a, an accommodation or ne- or regular negotiating format with Beijing. I think that's the best that you can do because the two systems are so fundamentally different. The way each system deals so fundamentally different with the outside world. Uh, um, just for instance, the U.S. is berating Ethiopia for human rights concerns in Tigray. The, the Chinese are poised to move into Ethiopia with more loans. They don't care about the human rights violations going on. And that's just one little example of how different the regimes are. And, and uh, aren't you afraid, uh, as an American strategist, that this uh, would be called a management of decline? That the United States being a hegemon of the last 30 years and uh, running the show, uh, you know, strategic flows, world ocean, global uh, exchange, you know, global trading system, you know, that this would be perceived as management of decline, especially that this management will be much more difficult than containment against Soviets, as there were, you know, real lines after the Second World War. So you didn't need to do any rollback, like now U.S. is doing with 5G, Huawei and stuff. You didn't need to compete for markets because Soviets were not part of this global su- supply chain and the system like China is. So it, it's going to be ma- management already sounds uh, weak and uh, like, you know, sort of a, a decline, declinist thing. And the credibility is everything of the U.S. Yeah, in Eurasia, and on, on top of that, it's going to be much harder than ever. Maybe there is no room for two superpowers on our planet. Well, uh, remember, remember something. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union did almost no trade with anybody outside because they didn't produce anything that anyone wanted to buy. So that the allies, for, you know, the European and Asian allies did no trade with the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact or with Red China, as it was called at the time. Um, but now you live in a world where, the, where America's top adversary, the Chinese, produce a lot of things that everyone wants to buy. Um, so that, we, you know, we're no, you know, there's no going back to the, to the level of U.S. dominance during the Cold War and even the immediate post-Cold War. Um, in, a, in a world of free trade where you have a, a, a Chinese economy of over a billion people producing masses of consumer goods and other things, and the Russians with energy to sell for the time being, the level of U.S. dominance is just it's impossible to recreate, you know, what existed during the Cold War and post-Cold War. You can call it managing, you can call it decline, but remember decline itself could be overrated as a term. You know, if you decline slowly over 75 years or so, there's a lot of good you can get, you know, you can get done in the world. Remember the British empire was really in decline from the late 19th century, from the 1880s onward. It was in decline, but it did not stop Britain from winning World War I and, in fact, saving the world in World War II uh, under Churchill. So I, I think decline is overrated as a term. If the United States can manage an equilibrium for, you know, going forward, that would be a great achievement. You know, it's not going because because consider this. If you, the America's domestic problems are out in the open, everybody knows about them and reads about them. But China and Russia are weak states, but you know, but it's more opaque. You know, the Chinese economy is you know is run but by completely by political decisions, which augurs very badly for the future of China's economy. And the Soviets have nothing but energy. You know, and, you know, and the world will pass from this period from this era of of hydrocarbons to something beyond it so that Russia and China do not have great prognoses either going forward so if the United States can hang on for you know for you know for a decade or two it may prove much more resilient than Russia or China uh, true but you know uh... It will be resilient for sure for its own security and prosperity, but not for the uh, net of alliances far away into Eurasia that, that are far away from the US. That's true. Right? 
That, um, that's true. And uh, there's also been a crisis of leadership in the United States. The, co- the post-Cold War presidents as a group are simply not as impressive as the Cold War presidents were. Hmm. You know, uh, since we touched a bit uh, about, uh, you know, Russia, so what is the future of Russia then, given this, uh, you know, the, the change, the shift in the world and the uh, Pacific being more important, China is growing as a neighbor and maybe controlling through Belt and Road, the continental supply chain, Russia being like, I don't know, the energy supplier, or maybe the guys in the Kremlin are waiting for the Grand Bergen from the U.S. or from They Europe. might be. Uh, remember, Russia has a declining demography, as we all know. Um, it relies too much on hydrocarbons, as we all know. This bodes badly for the future, though, of course, it's, that's a long-term proposition. You know, the Russians not only, you know, sell hydrocarbons, they produce military weapons, you know, you know they produce, you know, there, there are things that they sell. I think that, um, that the issue for Russia is governance itself as Putin ages, and the people around him who he trusts the most get old with him. You know, it becomes a difficulty bringing in younger people who you agree with, you know, you know, who you who you can trust. Um, You know, so it, it becomes difficult. But I agree that that belt of states, um, the intermarium, you know, you know, as it was called, um, between uh, the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea, between Russia and Germany, are the most threatened by this new world because you know Russia has an accommodation with Germany which will give it an accommodation with with Europe and is and may be seeking an accommodation with the United States in order for Russia itself to balance against China because Putin is uncomfortable being such a junior partner in the Chinese Russian strategic relationship so what what would be your advice then to the central and eastern europeans stay strong you know stay strong you know develop niche capacities in military so that you can defend yourself so to make it you know and especially develop cyber capabilities so that you you, you raise the you, you you make it harder and harder for the russians to intimidate you and at the same time you just you know small smaller embattled states whether it's Poland or Romania or Taiwan or Israel all need to simply have better diplomacy, be, you know, you, you know, better militaries and make fewer mistakes. I mean, the United States made a very costly mistake in invading Iraq, and I blame myself for that because I supported the war. But the fact is that the United States is so blessed by geography that it can that it can it could make mistakes like you know trying to solve afghanistan invading iraq and it can get away from them you know it can just go on because it has geography you know it pays very little price in a geopolitical sense for those mistakes countries like you know countries like poland or romania taiwan or israel cannot afford such blunders yeah you know, as a sort of reciprocal uh, gesture, I, I can tell you that at Strategy in Future, we run a lot of uh, geopolitical games. Uh, and in consecutive games that we have played over the last year, we played tabletop games, you know, analytical thinking. The, the, the only solution for the U.S. to, to stay preponderant in uh, global affairs is to withdraw to the world ocean, anchor on five eyes, plus Japan, and uh, sort of disentangle a little bit from Eurasia and change the paradigm of the warfare and, and control space. And by controlling world ocean and the space strategy flows and building a new space economy, in the longer run, it will be still the, the power that has uh, you know, controlled the system over, since the Second World War. Yeah, and that you know, in the consecutive games, the result was like that, which is fascinating. And I don't see even thinking in that terms in, in Washington D.C. And we closely monitor what is going on in analytical yeah. cir- cir- circles. And so the, on. the American elite is still very, despite the Trump era, 
the American foreign policy and defense elite is still very much a liberal internationalist elite, uh, you know, which could never do that. You, you know, it, um, you know, you know, it's it's DNA is geared to taking a deep abiding interest, you know, in allies in Europe, in human rights in Africa and all of that. You can argue with that. You can say it doesn't make sense for the United States selfishly thinking in the long run, but that's the DNA of the Washington elite. So um, you will always have isolationists in the US because we're a continental country with oceans on each side. Uh, um, but I, I think that, you know, th that the theory that the United States could go into like a quasi isolationist phase is something that works out on paper, but in an increasingly smaller, congested, you know, um, claustrophobic world that we live in of disease pandemics, of ransomware, et cetera. I don't see that happening. I understand. Fair enough. But at the same time, that calls uh, for conflicts because the more, the more congested we are, the more interactions we yeah. have. So the more conflict of interest may, may um, sort of uh, uh, appear. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. That has been fascinating, uh, as always. Uh, our guest today was uh, Robert D. Kaplan. Uh, uh, I hope that I will, um, you know, sooner or later, convince Robert to, to join us again. Thank you very much. I hope time. so. Thank you so much for having me. Goodbye.